Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, my name is Johanna Mank. I'm welcoming you to this afternoon's session, and which a truly important topic. It's about supporting people facing multiple disadvantages. And we have a distinguished panel here. To my, maybe, now it's difficult. Well, to my right and I guess to your left, is that correct? <laughs> Um, it's Evelyn, no, it's Kelsey Finlay. Um, here to my right and then also to your left uh, is Evelyn Huntians, both coming far away from Canada, and they will tell us about where they come from uh, within Canada. Next to me, I'm missing, and I hope she will come, Claudia Werneck. Um, she's coming. Um, and then we have got Josef, Maria, Sole, Javero, and I'm sorry if I did not pronounce it You correct. can say Pep, and is enough. Pep. Okay, Pep. Okay, here's Pep, um, and I will introduce all of them uh, a little longer before their speech. Um, what we are going to do today is have all them bringing in their introduction, their um, their inputs, and then afterwards we open the floor for your questions and inputs as well. Before we start, I would like to remind you that in the UN Convention there is a very good sentence about what we are talking about today. And it's called, uh, it's in the preamble, and it says, concerned that we are concerned about the difficult conditions faced by persons with disabilities who are subject to multiple or aggravated forms of discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, ethnic, indigenous, or social origin, property, birth, age, or other status. So we can see here the definition of multiple discrimination, uh, which we might all face. So welcome to you, to the panel. Um, and we now um, would like to give the word to the two uh, wonderful ladies next to me. May I first introduce um, Kelsey Finley, who will talk first. Um, you are, and also that's difficult uh, to say, um, Kualipu Ancestry, but you will tell the exact way to pronounce it. And it's a senior indigenous disability case manager with the British Columbia or, uh, Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. She's a social worker and possesses extensive experience working with indigenous uh, individuals and families living with disabilities who reside within both First Nation and non-First Nation communities. Through her work, Kelsey has assisted thousands of clients over the years in addressing their specific disability-related needs. And then, um, Evelyn will uh, talk to us, uh, and she's a member of the, again? Aniquatan. Oh. Aniquatan, thank you very much, uh, of the Nim Nimaya Nation. Good. Uh, Evelyn is the Senior Indigenous Registered Disability Plan Navigator uh, with the British uh, Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society. Evelyn possesses extensive financial experience gained from her previously work as financial planner. Um, so your work uh, um, really is, is working with the clients in financial management and assist them in reaching their long-term financial goals. Please, you have 10 minutes together to tell us about your work. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelsey, and yes, I'm from the Halapu First Nation in Newfoundland. And Evelyn is uh, from the Haniguatan First Nation in British Columbia. Our executive director, Neil Belanger, is over there, and um, he is from the Laxale clan of the Gitsan First Nation in British Columbia. 
Um, and we are very honored and excited to be here from the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, which is located in Canada, and our organization is called BCANS for short. And we're going to be talking about Indigenous disability. So BCANS is an award-winning Indigenous, meaning First Nations, Métis and Inuit, uh, cross-disability organization offering individualized disability-related programs and services in the province of British Columbia. BCANS was incorporated in 1991 and is the only Indigenous disability organization of its type in Canada. The image on the bottom corner of the slide, oh, there we go. Um, that image right there is the BCANS feather. It's our society's logo and it was created for us by a Cree artist who lives with a disability and the eagle in the feather represents the strength of all people with disabilities and then the red tip on top um, symbolizes um, specifically indigenous people with disabilities. So we have four main program areas which are disability case management, registered disability savings plan navigation, government consultation, and persons with disabilities benefits adjudication. We also have a number of time-limited programs and services that we obtain through various contracts. And all of our programs work together and share a common goal of empowering clients and families to be more included and independent members of their communities. So the Disability Case Management Program assists Indigenous individuals and families who live with disabilities to obtain necessary and disability-related services, supports, and resources. Basically, if you're an Indigenous person and you have a disability and you live within the province of British Columbia, you can access our case management program. And uh, case managers work with hundreds of organizations and communities all across the province to collaborate and successfully address the needs of our clients. We work in a lot of areas and some of the more common ones are listed up on the slide. Um, but currently we're working on expanding our services to be more accessible for Indigenous people living with disabilities that are currently in uh, correctional facilities. We conduct comprehensive intakes with each client to develop re relationships with them and get a better understanding of their situation, what their needs are, and what they want their future to look like. As an Indigenous organization, it's very important for us to build genuine relationships with each and every one of our clients so they know that their needs are a top priority for us. And typically a client will contact us and they'll be requesting assistance in one area, one or two areas, and then once we go through the intake process and build that relationship with them, we can usually identify additional areas that they would like help in, they just didn't know that the help was available for them. And now I'm gonna let Evelyn talk. Thank you, Kelsey, and good afternoon, Zero Project. I'm gonna start by talking about the BCANS Indigenous Registered Disability Savings Plan Program. Some of you may have already heard about the program through previous um, speakers, but our program, our BCAN navigators work with individuals to access the Registered Disability Savings Plan or RDSP. It is a poverty reduction strategy that helps fund long-term savings and can be best described as a pension for people living with disability. The benefit of the RDSP are federal government contributions and match savings, which can total up to $90,000 per plan. So it's a significant contribution from our government for people living with disabilities. The RDSP Navigator Program was created due to the low uptake with BCs, or British Columbia's most vulnerable indigenous population. Our program has identified many challenges and works one-on-one -on -one with individuals to overcome these barriers. BCANS provides individual navigation services from the start of the program right to the finish 
as well as we promote awareness of and education for the Registered Disability Savings Plan. BCAN's navigators have reached hundreds of individuals and through a coordinated approach with our other programs at BCANS, we've identified an additional 2,000 persons that may qualify for the Registered Disability Savings Plan. So there's still lots of work that we have to do. In a little over two years, and that's how long we've been operating our program for, our program has created a potential future financial impact of $18 million from opened RDSPs, and those are based on full participation of individuals. So the next um, program I'd like to talk to you about is the BCANS Persons with Disability Benefit Adjudication Program. So we work with the most vulnerable indigenous population in British Columbia. So those would be First Nations communities and people that live with severe disabilities. BCANS approves or denies persons with disability benefits on behalf of the federal government and we do this to ensure access to persons with disability benefits are provided in a non-discriminatory and fair process. Persons with disability benefits provides a guaranteed financial and health supports for those with financial need and those living with a severe impairment. I next want to talk about the government consultation and liaison work that BCANS does. We advocate to prioritize Indigenous disability. Our goal is to enhance the well-being and quality of life for Indigenous persons living with disability. BCANS actively coordinates with government and community-based organizations, and we contribute to advisory committees representing Indigenous disability. BCANS advises on several government initiatives that affect our clients and other persons living with disability. So that would be federal and provincial accessibility legislation and the BC Poverty Reduction Plan are a couple examples. Our success comes from the willingness of government and community-based organizations to partner with us. As well, our focus is to build relationships with people in key government positions. Next, I'd like to talk about sustainability of the BCANS organization. BCANS has proven to be a leader in responsive delivery of Indigenous disability services. We've been recognized with multiple awards and have been profiled nationally by our government. Like most nonprofits, our focus cannot solely be on our clients. We have to focus on keeping the doors open. BCANS does not receive core funding, so we are required to annually apply for financial resources. And lastly, I would like to talk about the future of BCANS and the direction we're heading towards. We are currently working towards federal recognition of Indigenous Disability Awareness Month, which is held November of each year, and this has been since 2015. BCANS developed this initiative to raise awareness of the barriers Indigenous persons with disabilities face and to acknowledge the valuable contributions they make within their communities. Indigenous Disability Awareness Month, as far as we know, is the only initiative of its kind specific to Indigenous disability and has been recognized provincially within Canada. 
BCAN's next goal is to bring our services national as well as we want to provide specialized services and supports for Indigenous women and for employment for Indigenous persons living with disability. BCANS will continue its work with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and the optional protocol providing shadow reports and presenting to the UN on Indigenous disability. We are very pleased to be here today and want to thank you all for all your great projects, programs, innovations and inspirations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for bringing this success story here to the conference and questions uh, can be asked later. Let me now turn to Claudia Werneck, who is a journalist coming from Brazil. Uh, and he, she's also an activist uh, for inclusion, accessibility, and rights of people with disability. Yes. Um, she published 14 books, in various languages um, and actually is the only Brazilian writer recommended simultaneously by UNESCO and UNICEF. So, seven, I think 17 years ago, um, you founded the NGO Scuola de Gente, Escola de Gente, um, and you can pronounce it much better than I can, so you'll tell us the right words, um, and which works with uh, the focus on population with disabilities and the lives in poverty. Um, you have won many acknowledgements, uh, human rights awards, uh, and all of that, and um, even from the president of Brazil. So congratulations on that, and please tell us about your project, your activities. Good afternoon. I speak firstly out of the microphone so that blind people know who I am. I'm very happy to be part of this conference since 2014. It is the third time our NGO is recognized as a best practice. In 2014, it was the Accessible Theatre Program. In 2016, the Accessible Reading Program, and now the Accessibility Promotion Agents Project, which trains young leaders with and without disabilities in the perspective of an inclusive citizenship. This year, we are, being, we are being doubly awarded by the Zero Project and by the Impact Trans Program, which we're recognizing our methodology as having a great potential to be replicated. In order to share with us this doubly award, I would like to introduce the Labor Prosecutor, Lisiane Chavez Mota, that is here, came from Brazil to this moment, and the Public Prosecutor of Labor is our main partner in this project, and is the Brazilian state institution empowered by our constitution to defend the rights and freedom of workers. This is a vicious cycle of cause and effect, effect between poverty and disability. Disability tends to be an important component of poverty. Therefore, the specific needs of people with disabilities, especially when living in poverty, should always be considered by policymakers as a necessary investment, never an extra cost. According to the UN, 80% of people with disabilities live below the poverty line in developed countries, as we see in the slums of Rio, Brazil. They lack basic sanitation, education, freedom, and security to come and go. This is the historical cycle of non-participations 
participation, sorry, of persons with disabilities in poverty. Because they do not have access to service, goods and rights, they are kept at home. They are not noticed by the communities as a part of it. As a result, the exclusion increases, the isolation perpetuates itself. As the cycle begins in childhood, young people with and without disabilities early lose the ability to perceive that they are intrinsic parts of the one same generation. This distorted way of thinking weakens the whole process of political decision making in the community. New generations of people with disabilities continue to lose autonomy and independence. How to break this cycle? How to educate people to rebuild the logic of the contemporary world that is so quick to discriminate and so slow to find inclusive solutions? How to help the youth to expand their models of human representation so that they could reorganize themselves for the future as mothers, fathers, citizens, workers? How? Would it be possible to design a methodology with such complex inputs? Yes. We have created a simple, low-cost and innovative methodology that works extraordinarily well for two reasons. First, it establishes a channel of communication among young people with and without disabilities and two, reeducates them from the perspective of an inclusive society a methodology inspired and supported by what we call communicational dilemmas. We believe the most, forms, the most serious forms of discrimination take place in the process of communication. Therefore, the antidote, the antidote for discrimination present should be more communication, but now an accessible one. So, we realized it was urgent for the youth to experience life as it should be, with all, form of, all forms of communication interacting in real time. It is the reason why the project offers total accessible communication every time. The goal is to tease the youth to discover the obvious that all kinds of communication are legitimately human and have the same value for society. In our project, the youth is challenged to collectively find solutions to the communication dilemmas, creating practical and original arrangements to solve them. Can you imagine how amazing it is to teach audio description to a class in which some students are blind, some others are deaf, and some are neither deaf or blind? We implemented our methodology in four major slums in Rio, all of them with serious crime problems. In this process, we were able to confirm how enormous is the intergenerational segregation. Intergenerational segregation. It was only in our classes believe that the most young people without disabilities had the opportunity to interact with young people with disabilities as well as young people with different disabilities had the chance to talk to each other for the first time as well. The agents are certified after a 45-hour course of inclusion, accessibility, non-discrimination and rights with the support of multiple accessible communication resources, such as easy language, audio description, closed caption, sign language, materials in digital media, braille, enlarged letter, among so, others. I'm sorry. And, and two minutes left, but uh, talk slow, please. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's difficult for me, <laughs> but thank you. Anyway, I'm sorry again. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat? No? Okay. We have trained 252 agents, aged from 14 to 29, 35 of them with disabilities. 
Many of them have become accessibility consultants in government companies and NGOs. Does the agent certificate inherence employability? employability? We believe it does. In the future, persons with inclusive abilities will be increasingly sought and valued by the job market. An accessibility promotion agent is a person ready to intervene if the right of participation of a person with disabilities is being violated. Conceptually, the right of participation is always violated when there are no accessible communication resources available so that people can communicate and be communicated. And this applies to any face-to-face -face or virtual situation. For example, one of our agents is always called by the local public hospital to interpret sign language for deaf patients, since there are no interpreters. We also promote accessibility youth encounters. In 2015, we took almost 100 young people to Brasilia with and without disabilities, capital of Brazil, to defend the adoption of inclusive laws in the National Congress. And finally, oh, finally, 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 thank you. <laughs> Inclusion for whom? Rich and poor, indigenous and non-indigenous, refugees and natives, persons with and without disabilities. The society that likes to split itself in two sides is always dangerous. Duality promotes the false idea that we always practice inclusion for the sake of a disadvantaged person or group. No, we practice inclusion first of all for our own sake in order to guarantee our own survival and well-being. Nobody is safe from a discriminatory society because Inclusion is a systemic, non-fragmented, and non-polarized process of finding solutions to new and old social dilemmas. We are inevitably a single system, and we lose this notion. We also lose the capacity to believe and to work towards an inclusive world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for reminding us why uh, we are all here <laughs> and the way before us and bringing the stories from Rio, from the youth uh, here into our conference center. So now we move back to Europe, uh, having Pep uh, with us. Um, he's a lawyer and director of the organization called support um, Girona, which is in Catalonia, Spain, as he said, still in Spain. Um, and he's also an, an active advocate of the UN uh, CRPD standards. He's a co-founder and I have here a list of in organizations he's part of. I'm, he might talk about it, but there are many. And which is also interesting, he's a consultant to the Andorran government on the UN CRPD. And also he's on the board of the EASPD, which is the European Expert Network on Supported Decision Making. Please. Thank you very much. Well, we have listening here and especially all around the Zero Project Conference, but here in this panel, how being part of a minority, indigenous woman, people with uh, less resources and economical uh, poverty living in some neighborhoods, and also experimenting disability is a hindering participation in society and enjoying rights as citizen. I want to remark that the fact that being an individual with a disability, no matter if you are part of not of these minorities, especially if you have a psychosocial disability, is a situation that generally is the condition for being de facto misunderstood in the society and being left apart. 
Support is an NGO that has been providing uh, during the last 15 years a service that still uses guardianship. I need uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you have to take care because guardianship in Catalonia has been used by the Catalan government as a very intensive, personalized and professionalized social service provided just by NGOs, social NGOs, when there are no relatives or social circles to support the person. is granted and adopted by the Catalan government as a first frontline service in many extreme social circumstances when around the person are conflicts and difficulties that are related to decision making and are of course uh, perceived by the, the environment, by someone, uh, also by the person it, itself. Despite the, the origins, now we are known as a very active NGO advocating for the right of enjoying legal capacity of persons with disability in line with Article 12 of CRPD. To do so, uh, we provide Support, direct support to individuals. Um, we are a guardianship organization in our origin, but 70% of our staff are social workers, not lawyers, not people managing assets, are social workers working in the field, in the streets, uh, and also trying to coordinate um, all supports around the person that we can achieve. Sometimes we perceive that uh, people with psychosocial disabilities, intellectual disabilities, in Europe, in our country, has the same rights formally than the others. Maybe they have the right to health. In our country, health is a universal service. You don't have to pay to go to the doctor. You, you can live maybe in the streets in front of a medical center, but you don't use the service that you, are, you have the right to use. And this is why our main focus is try to connect services and rights of the people around the person, uh, offering them opportunities that maybe before the person alone hasn't seen. Um, also, we are promoting a framework that in Catalonia uh, is just in Catalonia, our civil code allows. We have a system in line with CRPD that is called assistance. Then you, we will explain a little bit more in a video that we'll, we will pass. Our users uh, base is compromised with a wide range of users with different support needs. But the common element of this person and their families uh, are these two circumstances. First, difficulties, conflicts, perceived by the person or just by the environment um, that are related with decision-making processes. And second circumstance is that there is no family, um, people in the social environment of the person who can cope with these circumstances. Our um, quality plan is being developed by professionals within the organization to provide valuable inputs on how to enhance internal protocols to manage complex scenarios and provide global, flexible, and individualized support to the persons based on their will and preferences. To manage complex scenarios uh, uh, and to involve assessing situations, action, and attitudes of individuals and professionals we use a per case basis elaborating and individualized a super plan in which desires, will, preferences of the individual are the first and most important element and trying to execute it through social work and personal support strategies and reviewing it periodically with the person involved, of course. But in fact, we have 950 users we have recognized some circumstances that um, support, uh, supposes complexity. For example, when there is violent communication style or aggressiveness perceived by the person or by the environment around the, the case, when family undermines the individual's life projects, relatives and person have not the same approach to the circumstances, when there are um, substance abuse, toxics, 
when there are social alarm and community exclusion because behavior, conducts, when everybody perceives risk that the individual doesn't perceive, when there is a lack of uh, resources to afford evident needs of the person, when we, ha we have um, communication difficulties, but also when there are gaps in the professional coordination of the services, when different services in the same case has different strategies and then the, the person are lost on how to relate with them, when the person has to face criminal charges and is going inside and outside of jail, facing this, having also psychosocial disability, when there are a new influence, but this influence is also related with some kind of feeling with the person. The person trusts the people that are provoking them harm. And also we work, of course, in crisis, mental health issues, with risk of that the environment uh, um, promotes involuntary placement or orders. We have the, the lucky to be in, in Girona. Girona is one of the regions in Europe with less use of hospitalization in mental health, but at the same part, at the same time, we have the, the best uh, rate of long-term engagement with, of the person with the psychosocial disabilities to the community-based centers. Our last uh, media report in the main newspaper in our region faced doctors using bikes to visit, to visit uh, users because they don't have people in the hospital. And we prevent uh, the hospital equipment. Conclusions. Uh, around right to the site of persons with disabilities, uh, the treatment and how to manage the issues around mental health and psychosocial disabilities, um, we have the duty to coordinate the strategies in line with the will of the person. Um, there are no enough strategies to uh, face the complexity in managing the situations to prevent institutionalization or use of coercive measures. Sometimes we confuse personal workload with complexity. Complexity is not when there is a lot of work to do around the rights of a person. Complexity is when different stakeholders doesn't share the same vision in line with the person's will and preferences. And to face this complexity, we need, um, well, we have a video, but I think there is no time. You can see it in our, uh, in our uh, website. And uh, of course, we are open to work with everybody in the world who wants to deep in legal capacity and how to support people in difficult circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for bringing us this case, uh, in particular with decision -made, independent decision-making with uh, persons with mental disabilities. Um, so I provide now, we have another about 12 to 13 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, uh, and I would like to open up the floor. You've now heard these three cases, uh, initiatives, examples. Do you have questions uh, or comments to our panelists? Please, anybody here who wants to react or have a question? You can now use your right to free speech <laughs> to questions. Um, if not now, maybe they will come and, and I might have a question. Um, one would be to, to all of you um, within your initiatives, how in order sort of looking into the future, how do you see sort of the role of the civil society and NGOs uh, to help continue with your work and how do you see the role of the governments you work in sort of, I think that's for, for all of you that something that might be interesting in pushing this issue forward and whoever wants to talk or answer first, please. Thank you for the opportunity to talk more about the political situation of my country because we are in a very difficult situation 
we believe the our efforts will uh, face now um, a moment of um, being very disqualified and the poverty it doesn't seem is it is a question for the our president that has just been elected so um, I, I for me uh, that is the reason I am here with uh, the public uh, prosecutor of state I think the NGOs in Brazil have to look for to continue the work to look for institutional partners that can help and support the, all the efforts and practices we have already created. Otherwise, it will be impossible to continue. Hi. So, for our organization, something that's really important is the consultation and partnership process that we have with our government that's at a provincial level as well as a federal level and within the community organizations that the indigenous population lives in. I think it's vital to have the input from indigenous people that live with disabilities to overcome inclusion and things like structural racism that have existed in Canada, working together as collaborators is the only way to move forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you, and I give the word to well, Pep. Yeah, I think that 10 years after the entry in force of CRPD, we have seen that CRPD is not uh, ensuring the rights of people with disabilities in any place around the world. This is true. We have to learn, as a disability movement, to use CRPD as a political tool. And to use it as a political tool, we need democracy, of course. But also a legal tool. Because, in fact, 178 countries ratifying CRPD has committed to do their duties. And they will not do it if nobody demands for them. We have to learn how to use CRPD as a legal tool, demanding our, our rights, for example, inclusive education. If it's a right, it's a duty for the state. And families, NGOs, we have to demand, we want to comply with our rights. Social inclusion, accessibility, everything needs a more strong consciences of the, of the disability movement that we are not demanding um, for charity. We are demanding rights. And I think we still don't, uh, are aware of the power that rights can have uh, if we use it um, in the proper way. Hmm? Of course, to develop service compliance CRPD all around the world, we need uh, political uh, policies, laws, and financial schemes. But to start, we need just uh, will and, uh, and courage. Uh, and we have to use it. Thank you very much. Uh, is now a question from the floor? Do I see a hand? No? Then I, uh, to, to finish up. Yes, yes there is. Please speak up. Sorry, all the way in the back. Um, I don't know a lot about the situation in Canada, so apologies if it's not politically correct. Um, but I was wondering what specific issues do you see among indigenous persons with disabilities that warrant having an own uh, organization? Thank you for your question. Um, in Canada, indigenous people definitely still face a lot of racism, discrimination, um, they experience a lot of very, very severe poverty. Uh, lots of our communities in BC and, and across uh, the country in general have really rural communities, so there's lots of problems with accessing programs because there's no transportation, things like that. So I don't know if there's anything else you can think of. Good? Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you for bringing up this question. You know, what makes it even more difficult for a person who has a, um, a disability when you are a minority or youth or living in slum or mental disability is a specific case. And I think sort of we all have to take this into account. Um, I don't see another hand up. So for our final five minutes, I would like to ask each of you if you could give us one advice of working with sort of uh, these multiple um, difficulties when it comes to minorities, youth, uh, and disabilities. One advice each, please. Okay, I have to think about this. Um, one advice would be, who? Who wants to start? Pepe wants well, to start. One advice. Um, war, mm, make a lot of efforts to share the strategies, everybody around the person and the person. This is a key issue. We have to, to, to see the same view, and then it's very easy to support them for inclusion. If a professional says one thing, the person says another one, it's impossible. Thank you very much. My, my question was, can you give us here an advice Hi. So for me, if I could give advice, I would say that it's very important when you're looking at people living with disabilities is to take a holistic approach because a lot of times we work with clients and they may come see us for one reason, but there are many gaps that aren't being met. And if you don't work with the person and recognize that, they're not going to be successful. So I think really keeping an open mind and a holistic approach to make sure that you're helping fully would be my advice. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think this is uh, also an advice that's f true for so many things in our lives. And to add what uh, Evelyn just said, uh, it is super important for for us to build relationships with with people who come to us for for help because there's a lot of mistrust with a lot of our clients, um, usually kind of more connected with the government because of colonization and things like that. So just building relationships and kind of like helping them through the process and allowing them to take the lead on what they want help with instead of us trying to push them to do things I think is important and yeah, really letting them guide and we, we walk with them and we just follow wherever they wanna go. Thank you, I also think that's a very wise advice to build trust in your relationships. Well, I think we have to be more critical, uh, including with us. I even here in this so important conference that I, I came here so many times, I have been here. Uh, I, think, um, I, I think we are happier than we should be. <laughs> we are celebrating before the time I have, because we are so used to see only nothing about disabilities in the perspective of inclusive politics, democratization, um, many, I mean, the, 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 everything that is happening here is very important, and I have been the, realizing how the conference and how the people are, of course, in, um, um, bringing better ideas and practice, it is obvious for me, but my advice is let's not celebrate before the time. Me, you have to, way. it's a long way. We are uh, just uh, starting. There are, that is the, my advice for me as well. Thank you very much. So a strong call to never, never, never give up. And so we have to give up for now, for this session, but go out there and continue fight, work, and embrace inclusion. So thank you very much to this wonderful panel and to you. Thank you. <laughs>